Welcome to this fourth uh, webinar of the Play Green project. My name is Christina and I work at EcoSurveys, which is a non-for-profit consultancy, um, which is leading the uh, Play Green EU project. This webinar is on sport and env environment, and, and it will belong to a toolkit on how to green sport events with young volunteers. If you have any information you would like to discuss or add, uh, you can send us an email to uh, playgreenproject at ecosurveys.net. And here you have uh, all our partners as well, ecosurveys and the other, the other partners. So as mentioned, uh, this is the fourth webinar. You can see here how uh, Playgreen is uh, thought through. So this is the method and the this it has. Uh, if you want to have access to the recordings of the other webinars, the past three webinars, uh, please email us and we can give you access to, to the webinars uh, so you can go through them as well. Today we have uh, with us a very special guest, uh, Matthew Campelli. I first want to thank him for, for making the time to, to come and be with us. Matthew is a strategist communicator and a journalist. He's specializing in sustainability and sports. He's the director of sustainability at Touchline, uh, which is an agency specializing in sport and sustainability and reporting. And the founder and editor of the Sustainability Report. Uh, it's a publication dedicated to showcasing uh, uh, innovation and, and leadership in sport. I personally uh, really enjoy uh, the podcast that he that he made uh, the series of pod podcasts, and it was thanks to the series of podcasts that uh, I got in touch with him uh, because we wanted someone to talk about evaluation of sport events, and I thought he would be an ideal person to talk about it. So um, yeah, thank you, Matthew, and uh, without further ado, say I'll, I leave the room the room to you. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today and for um, logging on to this presentation about sustainable sports events. And today, as Christina mentioned, we'll be talking about the evaluation of sustainable sports events. Um, but we'll be talking in broader terms, not just about the evaluation of sustainable sports events, but about their design as well, because it's important to put this into, into context. One of the main ideas that I'd like to impress upon you this evening um, is that all sports events, large or small, must put sustainability at the very heart of their mission. Uh, this is not going to be a, 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 an option going forward. It's going to be an absolute requirement just because of the way that the world is working now. So what do we mean when we talk about sustainability? Today, primarily, we'll be talking about um, environmental sustainability. We're looking at carbon footprints of events, waste management, uh, resource consumption, air quality. Um, but when we talk about sustainability, it's very important to talk about it in the round with other elements of sustainability, the economic and social side. If you're logging onto this webinar and you're planning to you're planning a sport event, um, it's important not to just look at the environmental side, but just to look, but to look at every side as well and to have a more holistic approach than an ad hoc approach looking at just small environmental environmental programs. This was illustrated very well to me. Um, I spend my time speaking to sport and sustainability leaders. That's my profession. And one of the things that I'm most struck by is that outside of a bubble of people who are very in tune with sustainability, people often see sustainability as a cost, whereas they should really see it as an investment. Um, being sustainable uh, for the sake of being sustainable is, is the right thing to do. If we want to be socially and environmentally sustainable, it's very important that our events, our organizations, um, our institutions are, are being sustainable environmentally and socially. But also now within sport and sports events, we're seeing a more economic argument as well. We're seeing sports teams and organizations aligning with sponsors and partners who want to align with an organization and an event that is being environmentally and socially responsible. Sustainability and competitiveness do not need to be mutually exclusive in sport. And hopefully we're going to see more of that, more of that going forward. Secondly, before we get into the environmental stuff, it's important to look at the social side of sustainability as well. Um, who knows when we're going to see a, a scene like this again in a sports stadium with hundreds of thousands of people together cheering on their football team or other sports teams. 
it's very important in the post-COVID world and even in the COVID world that when we're looking at putting together sports events and putting a sustainability cloak around them, that we very much look at the human health side of things as well. This is going to be a very crucial and important aspect of things going forward after COVID. But here today, we're going to be talking specifically about the environmental side of sustainability. So what do we talk about when we're talking about environmental sustainability and events? Well, we're talking about the carbon footprint, we're talking about waste management, air quality, resource consumption. Um, the fact is, is that even though we're going through a very serious pandemic in, in, in the COVID crisis now, the fact is that climate change um, is an even bigger worry for the human race and for the environment. And it's very important that sport and sports events are very in tune with this and, and plan their, their events and organizations around these future challenges. Because the fact is that practically all sport now and in the future is being negatively impacted by climate change. We're seeing this with extreme weather, we're seeing it with flooding, we're seeing it with extreme heat, we're seeing it with longer summers and shorter winters, that all sport one way or another is being impacted by the changing climate. A couple of studies that I can point to, uh, within the UK, there was a big study a few years ago done by an organization called the Climate Coalition that found that amateur football clubs, amateur soccer clubs, were losing two to three months play because of extreme weather, storms and floods. Coastal golf courses in Scotland are being threatened by the rising sea levels. People playing cricket in places like Australia and India and South Africa are being massively impacted by the extreme heat, playing in conditions of 40 degrees Celsius, which when you're wearing pads and gloves and helmets, if you're familiar with the game of cricket, is a real, uh, it's, it causes real damage to their, to their, to their health. Uh, an interesting study done by a, a friend of mine, Madeline Moore, who who's the, the chair of uh, an organization called the Sport Ecology Group, which looks at environment and sport, uh, has done very um, interesting studies about uh, sports like baseball and cross-country skiing. Although they're totally different sports and totally different disciplines, both being impacted by uh, extreme weather, uh, the lack of winter, extreme storms as well. So it's something that sport really, really has to take really, really seriously going forward. And that's even before taking into account um, air quality as well. A couple of other studies that are really interesting to look at is some studies uh, looking at you know, the way air quality is really impacting athlete performance um, and match official performance as well. Interesting study on German football found that, uh, that soccer, German soccer players were 26% more likely to make errors if the air quality was bad. Um, in the US, looking at Major League Baseball umpires, they were 11% more likely to make wrong, erroneous decisions if the air quality was bad. And in terms of health, health consequences for spectators, uh, a piece of research around the National Football League, the NFL, found that as the number of spectators was rising, the air quality was getting worse as well. So everyone, all stakeholders are impacted by the changing climate and uh, also the effects of extreme weather and, and poor air quality. So, so what can sports events do to address these challenges and how can we evaluate that? The one thing is important to say is, is that sports events alone cannot address these challenges. That, that, that's very clear. Sport and sports events do have big, big environmental footprints. If we're talking about the construction of stadiums at a kind of large elite level, if we're talking about the movement of people between countries, spectating sports events, um, athletes traveling to sports events, there's obviously a carbon footprint associated with that travel as well. And that doesn't even talk about the kind of waste um, that's created during these events. So after talking to these numerous leaders in sport and sustainability, I came to the conclusion that when you're putting together a, a strategy for a sustainable sports event, you have to look at a couple of things. And I've picked out four specific um, targets to look at. The first one is to have an all encompassing vision. What do you want your sports event to achieve? Now, this can be in line with other wider objectives with a sports event, but it's important to have a clear vision of what, the, of what that's going to look like. The second is once you've had that vision, is to align that with standards, frameworks, and systems so that you know that what you want to achieve can be measured in smaller chunks and smaller objectives. The third one is that partnerships can really, really help. If you're talking about the supply chain uh, for sport, suppliers, suppliers are a huge part of the indirect carbon footprint and, uh, and uh, environmental issues related to sports events and sports organizations. Teaming up with partners who have similar objectives, similar values, can be a good way for a sports event 
to reduce its, uh, its negative environmental impact. And in terms of evaluation, it's really important to communicate and report what your event has done, you know, what it's responsible for in terms of carbon emissions and waste and how, and how the event has counteracted that and being really transparent with the stakeholders that, that matter, like fans, like sponsors, like governing bodies. So when it comes to the vision, a couple of the key things that I've learned is to, to start with the end in mind. So what, what does that mean? Um, essentially, that means looking at what you want to achieve by the end of the event, what you want the overall legacy of that event to be, and how can you, and how can you design something to work towards that? What do you want your event to achieve and what do you want it to stand for? What are the principles that you want to align to your event? Is there anything intrinsic with your support that you can align with? Are there any kind of issues at the moment that you think that your support has a real chance of making a, a big impact in? Those are the kind of targets that, that potentially you should be looking at. And does it align with your organizational values and objectives? A couple of good examples here is the Paris 2024 Olympics, which is coming up in three years' time. Uh, and their mission statement is that they believe that sport can change lives. Um, I'm, I won't read the whole statement out, but essentially it's about this idea of harnessing this once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime opportunity to spark uh, a kind of economic and environmental revolution in France. Um, this doesn't go specifically into the sustainability strategy of the Paris 2024 Olympics, but they've got bold ambitions. They want to be a carbon neutral games. I think the, the, the majority of the, the um, venues they're using have been built already. So there's, there's not a huge amount of um, economic or environmental cost with regards to building, building, new, uh, building new venues. Um, they want to power it all with renewable energy. They want to have big biodiversity projects to go alongside that as well. So there's this big kind of idea that the Paris 2024 Olympics is going to be a, a huge kind of catalyst for the, the low carbon economy in France. So that's an idea of, what a, of a big goal that a, a sports event can, can, can put out for itself. Similarly, Formula E, I don't know if, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of Formula E, the electric car racing series, uh, which has put kind of electromobility and clean air at the very heart of its vision. So their vision essentially is to get as many people as possible buying and using electric cars rather than petrol cars and to create a really clean air atmosphere in, in major cities. So these are the kind of big goals that, that I'm talking about. And it doesn't have to be on such a grand scale like the, the like Formula E or the Paris 2024 Olympics. I know that these are big, big budget events, but on a smaller scale, you can look to that, look to you know, similar big goals as well. Last year, the, the FIS Alpine World Ski Championships had the ambition of to be completely fossil fuel free, which is a big ambition. And Forest Green Rovers Football Club, which people um, who are familiar with sport and sustainability will, will know as one of the leaders in this space, have the kind of ethos that sustainability is central to everything they do. Their, their vision is to be the greenest football club in the world. So those are the ideas of you know, having, you know, planning with the end in mind, having a really big objective. But having a big objective is, is not enough when it comes to, to sports events. You have to have a roadmap of how you're gonna, how you're gonna achieve that. A selection of smaller objectives is gonna help you um, achieve that, 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 that big goal. And the best way to do that is to align with existing standards, frameworks, systems, that really help you understand as an organization and as an event what's important and how you can get there. And I'm going to run through a couple of these now. One of the most important ones is the ISO 2012-1 standard, which is an event sustainability management system that was put in place uh, initially for the London 2012 Olympic Games. Essentially, this is a tool that practitioners can use to make sure that they're making progress on sustainability objectives, whether that being economic, social or environmental sustainability objectives looking at things like carbon footprint and, and waste. So once you set a big goal, um, you can look at material issues that kind of feed into that wider objective and use this system to make sure what you're doing on a daily basis is helping you to achieve that goal. So it's very much steeped in, um, in, 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 in process and making sure what you're doing every day is achieving that bigger goal. A couple of organizations and events that have, uh, that have achieved the ISO 2012-1 standard is Formula E, I've already mentioned, the Philadelphia Eagles, which is a big National Football League franchise in the US, Wembley Stadium, which is England's national football stadium where many internationals are played. I think the final of next year's European Championships, which was supposed to be here, will be played at Wembley. And the Rio 2016 Olympic Games as well was ISO 
2012-1 certified. One of the larger frameworks that you can align with is the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which is essentially 17 of the most pressing issues uh, the world is facing currently. Poverty, climate change, equity and equality, um, sustainable cities and communities. Um, and a number of sports, forward-thinking sports organisations have aligned their sustainability strategies and event strategies with the Sustainable Development Goals. A couple of examples we're looking at would be uh, the World Cup in, uh, in Qatar in 2022. And I've picked out the environmental sustainability objectives because essentially that's what we're talking about today. So Qatar 2022 has uh, aligned its strategy with um, clean water and sanitation as well as climate action. And within those kind of objectives, they've they, they made smaller objectives, which are very which are very aligned with Qatar and some of the, the issues that, that the World Cup can actually help to achieve. Um, no one is here is saying that a, a sports event can help to achieve a sustainable development goal alone, but it certainly can have a, have a big impact, particularly when you're looking at the wider picture of spectators, uh, suppliers, sponsors, and, and, and roping them into that kind of thinking as well. Formula E, who we've mentioned already, their sustainability report uh, aligns with several sustainable development goals as well. So it's important here to look at some of the key objectives uh, behind the sustainable development goals and to see if your sports event can align with any of these issues. Another major one that was announced a couple of years ago at COP2024 um, was the UNFCC's Sports for Climate Action Framework, which is a sports specific uh, framework for, for reducing the carbon footprint of the sports industry. So this is essentially five kind of actions that sports events and organizers can go through to make sure that they're measuring, reducing, and offsetting all of their, their carbon emissions. So the first one is to make sure that you're having, you've got systematic efforts in regards to your climate action. So what we're not talking about here is we're not talking about ad hoc projects and offsetting some carbon footprint with a carbon footprint with carbon credits. It's about a systematic analysis of your event or your organization and making sure that every day you're continuously trying to improve and reduce that carbon footprint and then offsetting what you what you can't uh, what you can't reduce what is unavoidable the second one is reducing overall climate impact um third one is educating for climate action so this is about educating other stakeholders trying to get them along the same lines of thinking and reducing their carbon impact sustainable and responsible consumption and advocating for climate action as well some uh, events that have signed up to this climate action framework are the tokyo 2020 olympics and paralympic games the chicago marathon in the u.s the Wimbledon Tennis Championships and the upcoming Commonwealth Games, it's going to be in Birmingham, England in a couple of years time. Also, if you're aligned to an Olympic sport, um, a good place to look and evaluate your sustainable strategy for your event is to look at the IOC Sustainability Strategy, which was published in 2017, uh, which is a very thorough and fundamental piece of uh, literature if you're looking to, to become a more sustainable sports event. And very helpfully, the IOC have planned and put together a guide called the Sustainability, Sustainability Essentials Guides, which are really a kind of roadmap for sports organisations and sports events. The first one looked at sustainability essentials in the round. Um, another one is looking at carbon footprint and how you measure and reduce the carbon footprint of your, of your sports event. The third one is about sustainable and responsible consumption in terms of working with suppliers to make sure your carbon footprint, your, your, your indirect carbon footprint is as low as possible and making sure that your suppliers are doing the right things with regards to sustainability and, and, and how you go about choosing the right suppliers. And the fourth one and the most recent one that came out was around plastics and how you can avoid single use plastics and what you can do and what you can do with the plastics that are unavoidable and working towards circular economy kind of principles. And a little, bit more, a little bit more granular than that, um, some of the sports federations had their own sustainable event guidelines. So the International Equestrian Federation has its own handbook for event organizers. Uh, the FIA has its own best practices for sustainable uh, motor racing events. And World Sailing, an organization which I would consider one of the, the leaders in the sport sustainability space, has its own sustainability charter in which it is, is asking all of its, uh, its events special events to, to sign up to and become uh, more sustainable as well. So there are a number of um, frameworks um, and, and, uh, and standards that you can look to if you're organizing a sports event 
they can really help you with guidance and help you get towards that more that, that more um, substantial objective. As I said previously, partners and sponsors are really well placed to help you achieve sustainability objectives just because they, co they contribute so much to your events. A couple of partnerships that I've picked out um, that you can look at in more detail if you, if you want to do more research is the partnership between the International Olympic Committee and, and DAO. Uh, they have a big carbon partnership in which DAO invests in um, sustainable uh, innovation and low carbon solutions to offset the ROC's carbon emissions. In fact, next week, next Tuesday, I'll be hosting a webinar that's focused specifically on this partnership. So if you're interested in this, please drop me a line and I'm happy to send you the link to next week's webinar. Formula E, who, we, who we've mentioned a couple of times now, worked with their marketing partner, CSM Live, <coughs> excuse me, to create non-plastic um, marketing um, materials for, their, for the sidetrack of their race um, so that they don't contribute to overall plastic waste consumption. Olympique Lyonnais, the French football team, recently partnered with environmental services organization Veolia to create a, a water bar within the, their stadium um, so that people don't have to buy plastic bottles. So that contributes to the reduction of uh, the Olympique Lyonnais carbon footprint. The Philadelphia Eagles, who I'd also consider a leading organization in this, in this industry, have partnered with um, plastics company Brascom to create the circular economy model, which was also aligned around um, engaging fans as well. So what Brascom did is they collected one season all of the remaining plastic bottle caps that people had from beers and from water, and they melted that plastic down and they produced a replica of the Super Bowl trophy. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl that season, so they built this six-foot Super Bowl trophy out of recycled plastic. And whenever fans go through the concourse now of the Philadelphia Eagles arena, they can take pictures, they can look at this um, this trophy uh, that has been made from this recycled plastic. So it's really kind of engaging fans in a, in a not traditional way with circular economy principles and sustainability. So that's a really interesting partnership. And one of the other, the other interesting partnerships that I've seen in the past couple of years is the Equestrian Federation's partnership with Fortum. And what they did was they transferred the manure from the horses into electricity. They used that manure waste and converted that into renewable energy as well. So there's some real gains to be had uh, if you're a sports event in terms of partnering with some of your sponsors and suppliers. And that can also create a more kind of holistic and, and more concrete partnership with suppliers as well. So there are many benefits to, to, to doing this. And when we talk about the evaluation of sustainable sports events, transparency and communication are really, really key here. Um, so there are a couple of ways to communicate with your stakeholders and really give the process credibility. The first one is to do a report of your event. Um, London Marathon Events put out a really interesting report uh, a couple of weeks ago. Actually, it's quite a new report around uh, all, of the event, all of the events they do. So what they did was they put together some of the, the key kind of um, achievements they had during the London Marathon in terms of plastic waste reduction, in terms of carbon footprint reduction, uh, low energy, um, and really kind of showcased as well what they were responsible for you know, what the carbon footprint of the race was, what the waste, uh, um, you, know, how, you know, what waste they, they, uh, they, they garnered during the, during, the, during the race as well. So being really transparent about what occurred during the race and how they're trying to kind of um, address that with, uh, with strategies. Within this report as well, they've also articulated uh, what they want to achieve with events going forward as well. So really giving a step-by-step -step of, you know, what the objective was, what they achieved um, and how they can improve the process going forward. Again, Formula E have a sustainability report every year which they publish, in which they highlight exactly where their carbon emissions and waste is coming from um, and how they're working towards reducing that as well. So being really transparent with stakeholders and setting objectives for the following years, seeing what they've done and seeing how they can improve the following years as well. So just to illustrate um, some of the real leadership case studies, um, I've gone for a couple of organizations. Um, the first one that I would like to discuss is World Athletics. In early April, World Athletics published its first sustainability strategy, a really um, concrete and wide-ranging piece of literature which looked at the whole organization of World Athletics. But there was a lot in there to do with the World Athletics events that they host every year and, and license every year. So I've looked at it from the kind of framework that I set out at the beginning of the, of the presentation, which is around vision, 
alignment with standards, partnerships and communicating. So within this world athletic strategy, their overriding vision is to become the leader, the leading international sports federation in delivering best in class sustainable events. So that is a really high bar they set for themselves. That is their objective going forward over the next five, 10 years. How they're going to do that is they're going to align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They're going to make sure that their events are ISO 2012 on certified. And with their partnerships, they're targeting 100% of corporate partnerships to be, to be engaged in activating around sustainability. So whenever a partner comes and says, I want to sponsor one of your races, I want to be involved, then they're going to really scrutinize their sustainability operations and try and find a way that they can work together to create sustainability activations and projects that are really kind of intrinsic to both organizations. And in terms of communicating, they're going to have annual reports and they're going to try and convince some of their athletes to become sustainability ambassadors. I was first became aware of World Athletics Leadership in, in this area uh, about a year and a half ago when they started making air quality one of their major strategic objectives. So they've realized that athletes, whether they're elite athletes or if they're recreational joggers, that air quality, particularly in big cities, is a real, real big issue for people who are running. If you're running in New York or in Rio or in Tokyo or in London or Milan, um, you, although they're going to be health benefits to you running, cardiovascular benefits to you running on a regular basis, the air that you inhale as a runner, um, if it's poor quality air, could really, could really be detrimental to your health. Uh, World Athletics have identified this and they, they put this as a key part of their, uh, of their strategy. So what they're doing is, is that they are trying, they're working with a partner called Kunak, which is a Spanish based company, and they're trying to integrate air quality monitors in all of their certified tracks, which is about a thousand around the world, I think. And during the event in Yokohama last year, which was the world relays, they actually tested air quality in the arena and in the training facility for the first time. And unfortunately, since COVID struck, that has kind of put the blocks on the next part of that initiative. During the under 20 championships in Kenya that were supposed to occur in June or July this year, I think, they were going to look at air quality of the, um, of the venue and try and correlate that with athlete performance and athlete health to see what impact air quality is having on athlete health. So this is a really innovative way to look at sustainability and human health, looking at the real issues that are intrinsic to that sport and their events, and actually trying to make you know real measurable data um, available um, to, to have a real kind of stake and a real um, and a real contribution to uh, to a worldwide effort to reduce poor air quality. The second organisation I want to talk about is the Ocean Race, who had the vision um, to act as a, a catalyst to help restore ocean health. Ocean health and sailing is really intrinsic. Sailors are really care very much about the ocean, and, and plastics obviously is becoming a real issue for the ocean. The Ocean Race is aligned with the ISO 2012 One standard, and it's got several partners who are helping them to become more sustainable. The 11th Hour Racing is the sustainability partner. Volvo, the car company, has, uh, has made some real sustainability commitments as a result of being part of the Ocean Race. Uh, I know that they've, they've committed to become, they've eliminated um, single-use plastic, I think, in 2019. I think 25% of their cars from 2024 or 2025 uh, will use uh, recycled plastic as well. Uh, they've got a partner in Blue Water, which uh, is, a, is a, a water purification company, which uh, helps to reduce the, the use of plastic water bottles, and the IUCN, which, which they work around biodiversity as well. If you look at the Ocean Races communications on Twitter or LinkedIn or on the Instagram, sustainability is everywhere. Um, they have reports, they use social media to really harness their sailors' voice. They talk an awful lot about ocean health. It's a really core cool part of their organization. And physically, they have their ocean summits as well, where people can go to um, go to stop offs when they when they stop off at various places around the world, and really see kind of what they're doing around sustainability. They have education programs, ambassador programs, so pretty much everything they do revolves around sustainability and ocean stewardship. And during the 2017-2018 edition of the Volvo Ocean Race, they did a really innovative project where some of the teams were going around the oceans, particularly really desolate and, and hard to reach places in the ocean. And they were measuring the amount of plastic and microplastic that they found in the ocean. So doing really impressive science experiments, um, really beyond the scope of the organization to really make sure that they're having a real 
um, that are really participating and contributing to, again, like World Athletics, a real big global issue. So in a nutshell, um, to design and evaluate sustainable sports events, you need to think about and articulate your wider vision. Then decide the frameworks and standards that you're best placed to align with. So you've got those smaller objectives and steps to try and achieve that bigger, grander goal. Then see how your objectives match up with partners and see how you can work together to make sure that you can have much bigger impact and you can amplify that impact. And finally, keep stakeholders updated on your progress and make sure that you're reporting, that you're communicating, that you can actually evaluate what you've achieved and try and achieve better the next time. If you want to find out more about some of these kind of leadership organizations in sport and sustainability, please feel free to check out my website, which is the Sustainability Report. We focus on sustainability, innovation, leadership in the sports space. We've got a free newsletter that comes out every Thursday where we write a big analysis piece. We have a podcast as well. So for all of these kind of up-to-date trends and issues, you know, feel free to, to come and see us and sign up to the newsletter because there's a real, there's a real wealth of information that, that could potentially be useful to you if you're organizing a, a big or small sports event. And I love connecting with people. Um, I love um, talking about these issues because I think they're really important. I really think, and I hope that you think that sport can have a real, real big important part to play in some of these wider issues around climate change, around air quality, around ocean health. So please drop me a line. Please email me at the address that you can see there. Um, feel free to um, engage via LinkedIn. And I'm always, always on Twitter as well. So please feel free to get in touch and I'm happy to discuss any kind of, um, any kind of issues or anything that you, uh, that you think could be, uh, that can play, that can contribute to this, this conversation. And uh, now that the presentation is ended, I'm really welcome to carry on this dialogue and uh, take some questions if you have some. Thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. It was uh, really enlightening. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if someone wants to ask a question, but there were, well, people think about questions and any, in any way, uh, some people already wrote down when they registered. So uh, someone asked uh, how to ensure sustainable sport events uh, during coronavirus, uh, during a pandemic. Uh, this was asked two times and we wanna know your, your opinion on that. Yeah, sure. This is the question of the moment, isn't it? Because I think the sport and sports events are going to be so encompassed and so inundated with you know, issues around coronavirus. When can we let people into stadiums? When can we let athletes compete? When is it safe to do all of these, all of these things? And I suppose the way you can keep sustainability at the very heart of this is the fact that coronavirus didn't happen in isolation. Um, everything is interlinked. If we, look about, if we look at the degradation of the environment, if we look at animal welfare, if we look at climate change, if we look at human health and coronavirus, I mean, these are all things that are interlinked. And if you try and address coronavirus in isolation, then you're only putting a band-aid on the problem. As organizations, and this is, this is probably a bigger, bigger than sport, and this is obviously for governments and big organizations as well, but to address an issue like coronavirus, you have to become a more sustainable organization. It's inevitable that you have to be. You have to take into account the environment. You have to take into account human health. Um, because if you don't, um, then these issues are just going to continue to happen. There'll be more pandemics. There'll be more issues like this. So sport, if sports events and sports organizations are pushing back and saying, okay, let's forget about the environment now. Let's forget about climate change. We've got a bigger fish to fry in the pandemic. The fact is that that's not correct. Climate change and the effects of climate change, particularly if we're talking about human fatality as well in human life, climate change is going to have a much, much, much larger effect. Um, and even if sport is not going to play the biggest role, sport can play a, a huge role in this with regards to liaising with um, governments, um, suppliers, sponsors. So the, the short answer is that we really need to keep sustainability front and center because of the pandemic. Okay, yeah. Um, there's a question that I also have because uh, you talked about big sport events, of course. Um, and I was wondering 
what is your opinion on uh, grassroots sport events? So do they have, uh, what's their role in, in creating or, or making sports events and the sport feel more, more sustainable? So small sports events, I think, can be even more important sometimes than larger sports events, just because they're so community-based and they can really, they can really engage people because the people in your community are, are participating people in your community are organizing them. And you'll know people who are organizing and participating in these events. You can have these conversations on a really meaningful level. So we talk about World Athletics and the ocean race. We were looking at air quality and looking at ocean health on a really big global scale because these are big sports organizations. They've got the, they've got the capacity to look at these things in a larger way because they're bigger partners, they're bigger sponsors, and they're bigger budgets. So they can look at these. But depending on what part of the world you're in, your locality will be facing certain crises, maybe not crises, but certain issues that are aligned with the sustainable development goals, that are aligned with um, you know, climate change as well. Maybe you live by a coast and you'll see the seawaters are rising. Maybe you live in an area, a mountainous area, where skiing and winter sports are a big part of your, your annual kind of activities. And you're seeing that window of opportunity to play those sports. They're getting smaller and smaller. So although you may not be able to create this huge wider strategy around um, climate change that some of the biggest sports organizations can have, you can still look at smaller projects that you can do with small, you know, partners in the local area. You can engage local people, local governments, local organizations, and create smaller projects that still have big impact. So I think smaller organizations and smaller events can still do things they can still make a, a big impact. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, on the chat. Um, if you want to, well, we can uh, read it. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Um, my question concerns national federations with limited budgets and human resources. What strategies would you use, recommend to get uh, the buy-in from these federations, coaches, athletes uh, to prioritize sustainability without compromising the focus on results? That's a key question. That is a, that is a key question. That is a, that is a great question. And it's one that we're grappling with now, really, because like I said in, in the previous answer to the last question, is that people are so focused on a short term with COVID now, the things like longer term strategies around sustainability are being, I wouldn't say forgotten is the wrong word, but they're falling even lower than the priority list. And for some sports organizations, they were quite low to begin with, unfortunately, um, because there are some very forward-thinking sports organizations, but there are some that are very short-termist as well. We have to be honest about that. We have, to be, we, have to, we have to see it for what it is. So how do we go about getting engagement from sports organizations, particularly during a tough time like this? I think I partially answered the question when talking about COVID in a more kind of holistic way, and looking at this as part of a wider issue with regards to how we treat the environment, how we look after the environment. But I think one of the main things that we can look at, even in a more short-term basis, is that sports organizations, particularly international federations and other even smaller sports organizations, are really reliant on sponsor money, sponsorship money now, um, particularly now that spectators are not going to be attending for the foreseeable future in some countries. And sponsors now, many big organizations, are very well versed in the language of sustainability. So the sustainable development goals will be, um, they will know of the sustainable development goals, they'll be familiar with them. And their own company objectives will be related towards not just creating more profit and to creating growth, but around sustainability as well. So when they're aligning with sports organizations and sports events, they'll want to make absolutely sure that the event and the organization that they're aligning with is not compromising their other objectives, is not compromising their objectives around climate change, is not compromising their objectives around gender equality or their objectives around air quality as well. So what I think what you'll see is you'll see more engagement from sponsors and even fans as well, who are very invested in these types of, um, who are very invested in these topics. And I know from speaking to a couple of clubs and international federations that more and more sponsors are saying, what are you doing about climate change? What are you doing about gender equality? We want to see this before we even think about sponsoring you. So my pitch to sports federations and organizations who are perhaps 
skeptical about sustainability and its value is that sustainability will have a monetary and economic value going forward. That's for absolute certain. It will help you engage better with sponsors. And eventually it's looking, the data is showing that it's going to help you engage more with fans as well. So it's not about philanthropy. It's not about doing the right thing, even though I think it should be about doing the right thing. But there is definitely a business case that is being put together around sustainability in sport. We had, uh, we have another question. It's been answered from. Uh, I think we're creating a discussion right now already. Um, but uh, if you want to answer, uh, there's. A, I've been heard discussions about offsetting. Um, this is a huge topic. I think it would be worth uh, doing a whole other webinar just yes. on the idea of offsetting because it's uh, it has uh, people who love it, people who hate it. Uh, I'm not going to give my opinion right now, but. Uh, some people that say it's better to use uh, that money and invest in uh, communities instead of giving their money to organizations that might invest the money in an offset project, but there is not a contributory uh, if it is invested in the right way. What is your, your opinion on that? Yeah, offsets can be a divisive topic. I think you're right. Um, my opinion, I think the opinion of most people with the sustainability orientated um, focus, believe that offset should only be used absolutely when you've reduced as much as you can. So offset should not be as a, as a way to just forget about your carbon footprint. You should first reduce as much as you can. And then when everything else is not possible, like for example, if you're going to be hosting an event and athletes and spectators are flying in, then that, that can't be helped. You know, we're, we're going to have to keep, we will keep having sports events. People will keep traveling. In that case, you can, you can offset. Um, and if you do offset, it's best to go with a gold standard project where you know that it's going to be, um, that you're investing good money. Um, some of the, some of the offset projects that I've seen that have become more of a trend recently is investing in cook stove projects as opposed to, for example, reforestation projects. So I know that there was a big project in some of the American leagues. I think the MLS, NASCAR, um, the New York Yankees, and the US Tennis Association. I got together and invested and offset the carbon emissions by investing in cook stoves in East Africa um, for the simple fact that they hit a couple of sustainable development goals, not just around climate change, but also around gender equality and biodiversity as well. So their thinking is, is that if they can invest in these cook stoves, that limits the amount of time typically women and girls will need to cut down um, firewood um, and to use that to, to cook within their own houses. That will help them reduce kind of health related issues such as strokes that, that come from the smoke from burning that, that that fire and also that will limit deforestation as well so that's some one of the trends that i've seen recently with regards to offsets um but yes my, my fundamental opinion is that offsets should be used as a last resort when there's no other way to there's no other way to reduce oh. yeah absolutely i i I agree uh, 100%. Um, also, uh, we should take into account uh, where we invest the money and, and make sure that we're doing more good than bad. Because oftentimes, with international development, we think that the North is helping the South, that is actually doing more damage by thinking that it's doing something good. So uh, um, I think I think that's a very nice uh, nice approach. Um, I was gonna, well, they were telling me to close. Um, if there's no any other burning questions uh, because of time, but um, just to say thank you, Matthew, for, for your time. If you can put your uh, link on the next webinar that you're holding here, maybe on the chat, or maybe you can send it uh, later and we can send it to a newsletter to to everyone and so everyone can uh, follow you on your next uh, webinar uh, and uh, I don't know maybe they can find you they can follow you on Twitter and you will post it here so it's easier for them um, so that's that's uh, that's an option uh, oh okay yeah <laughs> everyone is saying thank you so um yeah um take care
Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Christine, for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I could speak for another hour about this because I'm very passionate about this topic. But please, anybody who's still on the webinar, uh, please feel free to get in touch. I always like linking up with people who have uh, similar ideas and even conflicting ideas. It'd be good to discuss that as well, to learn from each other as well. So please feel free to drop me a line and let's carry on the discussion uh, offline. Yeah, uh, the presentation. So if you have registered, we're going to send you the presentation, a link on uh, to the presentation as well. So we're, we're going to send you. And if you have, you can also email us at uh, playgreen, uh project at ecosurveys.net and we will send you uh, the link and uh, with Matthew's information as well. So yeah, thank you. We will have to organize more to talk about carbon offsetting and other topics. Okay. But, uh, and we, we have time for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.